You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of the music industry to explore how technology is changing the way business gets done. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm the CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, a PR firm that focuses on music and technology. And I'm also the organizer of the Music Tectonics Conference, which is October 28th and 29th in Los Angeles. And before we get to this episode's guest, who's the CEO of Sound Exchange, Michael Huppy, I want to give some background so we can leapfrog the basics and get into the conversation. Sound Exchange is the nonprofit designated by the US Congress to collect and distribute digital performance royalties for, for sound recordings. This primarily, primarily means that Sound Exchange collects royalties for the use of sound recordings on satellite radio, like Sirius XM, non interactive streaming, like the original Pandora service, sometimes called non interactive, and other webcasters, and pays those royalties out to featured and non featured artists and master rights owners, which are record labels or artists who operate as their own record label. On a side note, Sound Exchange is not the same as a performing rights organization or PRO, like ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. PROs pay the publishers and songwriters, so that's a different recipient, and PROs are collecting royalties based on public performance in venues, on TV networks, and in some situations, some countries, on radio stations. So different uses than what SoundExchange is collecting on. As of 2018, SoundExchange had paid more than $6 billion to recording artists and rights owners. More than 14% of U.S. music revenue passes through SoundExchange. In 2018 alone, Sound Exchange paid out over $950 million. Still, even with Sound Exchange showing up to many music industry gatherings, you may have seen them at South by Southwest, for example, there are performers and master owners who have not registered with Sound Exchange, which means they're not getting paid all the money they deserve. So if you know anyone in that situation, tell them to register. It's one of those things that should always be on the checklist. Are you registered with Sound Exchange? Those are kind of the things that Sound Exchange is known for, but there's more. In the process of handling all this data and these royalty payouts, Sound Exchange has developed several tools and APIs to help the industry overall, which we'll probably get to during today's conversation. But Sound Exchange is also an advocacy organization. Today's guest, Sound Exchange CEO Mike Huppy, advocates for getting AM and FM radio to pay labels and recording artists for the use of recordings, works. Uh, they also work with the Copyright Royalty Board to adjust rates to the benefit of copyright owners and creators. And they advocated for the recent passing of the Music Modernization Act, which among other things, <sighs> gotta catch my breath here, includes new protections and payouts for pre-1972 recordings and for producers, mixers and engineers to get paid, which was not really happening, both of which Sound Exchange has been advocating for for a while. In addition, the establishment of a new entity to administer a blanket license for interactive streams as well as downloads of musical works embodied in sound recordings was based on the Sound Exchange model. So that'll be something we can get into. And depending on how things turn out, Sound Exchange itself may be the back office for this new entity called the Mechanical License Collective, though there is a second collective vying to administer this entity too. So we don't know exactly how that'll play out, but it's good to know that Sound Exchange has advocated for that and may be involved down the road. Michael Huppy, CEO of Sound Exchange, welcome to Music Tectonics. How are you, Dimitri? Happy to be here. I'm, I'm great, and I really appreciate you taking the time. You're in DC right now, where you're based? We are in DC, that's sure. Awesome, yeah. And sorry for the long intro, but again, I just, I just wanted to make sure that if people hadn't heard all the details, they at least have them and they can go back and play it at half speed and study up before we get into our conversation. No, no problem. Uh, you know, the world we live in, and in fact, the whole music industry is pretty complicated. So uh, long intros are okay. Cool. I appreciate that. So I saw you a couple weeks ago at this year's Music Biz Conference in Nashville, where you were on a panel where someone joked that the MMA, the Music Modernization Act, is actually the Music Almost Modernization Act. Um, but it appears that a lot of the advocacy that you and Sound Exchange have been pushing for is starting to come to fruition. So I'm curious how you're feeling about the MMA. Sure. Yeah. No, that I know that joke well because I'm the one that made it. Um, you know, the Music Modernization Act didn't fix every problem in the industry. Uh, that's why. That's why it's. Um, it didn't totally bring us up to where we need to be, but it was an unbelievable step forward. You know, if if you ask how I'm feeling about the MMA, I'd say uh, it is really is a, a, a watershed moment for the industry. It's the first time in decades that the industry has seen real meaningful legislative improvements to try to uh, bring the laws into line with what's happening in the industry today. Uh, and there, there are, you know, there are a lot of things baked in the MMA uh, uh, that 
benefit a lot of different parts of the industry. So some of the things the MMA brought uh, around are, are, have been immediately impactful. You mentioned uh, some stuff related to studio producers, who, who uh, many of whom are list, your listening audience. You know, Sound Exchange has always paid studio producers as part of what we do. It's not required, but we've, we've always recognized the value that producers bring to the musical experience. So we have been um, honoring letters of direction and paying out producers for over a decade. And what this law does is just uh, make it mandatory for whatever collective is doing what we do in the future has to has to do what we've already been doing. Uh, as you said, it also uh, helps uh, some older performers pre-72 who were not being paid in the digital world. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, but you know, some of the biggest streaming services out there were paying performing artists who recorded after 1972 and uh, with, but not before 1972. And one of the things that the MMA did that had immediate effect was to bring those legacy artists into the fold, allow them to participate in the music economy. So those are a couple of things that happened right away. Uh, the One of the biggest pieces of the MMA that you talked about is creation of this, this new right, this new license to help digital service providers get the rights they need to use the songs when they, you know, when they need 30 million songs to, to, to form their service. And there's a lot of work that, that is going on right now to try to make that come to fruition. So, so is what you're saying that it's going to remove some of the friction of them getting those licenses as a result? Absolutely. I love that you use that term. That's one of my favorite terms. You know, a lot of the, when you look at the technology and the laws surrounding the music industry, there is a lot of friction. There's a lot of stuff holding us back. Um, you know, just like friction in an engine or, or in a car uh, as it slips through the air. Many of the, the way the laws, many of the laws and many of the uh, technological approaches to music are holding back the industry. And one of the things the MMA does is help to remove some of that friction. Um, the, the, MLC, the MLC that you mentioned earlier, this entity that's being created to help administer the rights to songs, uh, you know, that has been a tremendous challenge for the whole industry, uh, trying to get the rights and clearances that, uh, that a service provider might need to launch a music service. Uh, there are many, many places you had to go. There wasn't one central place to get what we call the mechanical rights. It's the rights to basically put the copies on the server if you're Spotify or Pandora or Amazon. And what, what this law did is it said, you know what? Let's create an entity that is run by the music publishing industry. It's staffed by publishers and songwriters. We set forth in the law you know, we Congress are going to set forth certain requirements and it'll be a way to help streamline the licensing so that digital service providers can, um, can get what they need to operate. And so the money is more likely and more efficiently paid out to the songwriters and publishers that own the content. Well, I almost want to go down the rabbit hole just a tiny bit more, Mike. Um, on the surface, it looks like the MMA has the support of the music industry of the publishing uh, publishers and songwriters um, implying that it's going to generate new revenue but the way you're uh, presenting it it sounds like the DSPs have as much to gain as well is that through efficiencies yes I mean the part of the reason the MMA passed is because everybody across the industry and I mean that uh, in the largest sense of the term you know digital service providers are part of the music industry and in that they are some of the the you know, they're part of the way that people get their music nowadays. And the DSPs definitely benefited because rather than uh, having to go to innumerable places to get the rights that they need to who published this work, you know, if you're, if you're a DSP and you need to launch a service, like I said, it's a very challenging business to get the clearances. In the old world where we were thinking in terms of singles or LPs and you had to clear publishing, you know, you'd have to go get 10 or 12 songs cleared. There might be, you know, whatever, 20, 25 writers, publishers you had to deal with. Still not an easy task, but a vastly different task from having to clear 30 million or 40 million songs. Um, that when you're dealing with the scale of the streaming economy where you have, you're not talking about singles or albums, you're talking about millions and millions and millions of songs and clearances that you need at launch. That's, that's a, that's, 
a challenging um, thing for for a user of of the songs to do. They should do it. It's what it's what the law requires. You need to get the permission of the songwriter and publisher to launch a service. Uh, and they were having some challenges, so they definitely benefit from having a centralized place where they can. Uh, make the request, pay the royalties, and then the industry itself, meaning the music publishers and the songwriters, help figure out and ensure that that money gets, uh, help supply the information about who owns the song, which publisher, which songwriter wrote it, and then they help get the money to the people who need it. Interesting. So a lot of these adaptations, uh, as it relates to the music industry shifting to the streaming era, have a lot to do with data and attribution. Um, and I'm curious, do you think there could have been a solution other than legislation to get the industry to make the, the correct payments, fair payments? That is a great question, Dimitri. And, and I, guess, um, I guess I'll say yes and no. Uh, some things will never be solved without legislation. You mentioned uh, our, our ongoing fight to get terrestrial broadcast radio to pay for the, the recordings. Um, what, something you're users may or may not know is that uh, terrestrial radio FM broadcasters, when they, when they use the sound recording, they don't pay a dime for the rights. They, they pay for the underlying song that the songwriter created as they should. The songwriter is a very important part of the process, uh, but they don't pay the performer any money to use that. And we, we stand alone in the industrialized world and in not compensating the performer. So things like that require legislation. You're not going to get uh, a broadcast industry voluntarily paying a royalty if they don't have to. So some some things uh, need Congress to step in, but there are a lot of things that could happen that that don't necessarily need leg legislation to fix. And I think the industry is already doing some of them. Uh, we need as an industry to move towards better data standards, have you know standard delivery formats. We need to have better metadata so it answers the question of who owns what whether it's a recording or a song. And I think we can do a lot as an industry without Congress, you know, uh, <laughs> getting Congress to, to move legislation is a very difficult process, especially in the very intricate and complex world of the digital economy as relates to the copyright law. So uh, there are definitely things that the industry can do in terms of standards, delivery formats, centralizing uh, data, creating resources that will allow all of the industry and the whole ecosystem to know who owns what and how, how to get licenses. Much can be done short of legislation. Yeah, it's interesting to think about that in terms of partly just kind of the history of how things unfolded. There's existing legislation that no longer was quite uh, the most effective way to address how music's being uh, listened to and and licensed these days. So uh, that may be part of the answer, too, is that we're in this transitional moment where we have to move from previous legislation to a new marketplace. Yeah, it's absolutely true. It is sort of it's undeniable that the law cannot keep up with technology. It's, it just can't, you know, um, what it takes to see a problem, come up with a solution and gather the political strength to pass it through Congress takes years and years and years. So the law will always be a little behind technology, which shouldn't surprise anybody out there. Um, and, uh, and we just have to, you know, keep, keep pushing to make the law and the standards be as close to modern as they can be, right. knowing that we're always going to be a little bit behind. Right, right. That makes sense. So so we, that's kind of like looking back to where we're going. If you look forward, what can be done to future-proof copyrights and intellectual, in, and intellectual property of rights holders for unforeseen future uses of music? What do you, what do you, in your role now, what do you guys think needs to happen so that we're more prepared for what we can't see? <laughs> uh, interesting question. Um, you know, from a legal standpoint, it's it's hard to think of how to future proof it. Kind of playing off the the what we were just talking about a minute ago. There are going to be things happening in ten years that we can't even think of. Uh, that uh, awesome new uses of music, unbelievably creative consumer products, consumer offerings, ways to deliver not just music, but I will say musical experiences. You know, it's we're we're thinking in the streaming world now. Well there could be something even beyond streaming that no one is thinking about now. And it's pretty difficult to, to have the law or regulations or, you know, the structure of an industry predict that. 
So future proofing that way would be a little bit hard. But here's what I would say. One way to help enable quicker adjustment in the future to these changes is to just have better information. You know, in many things in life, whether it's business or heck, you know, consumer behavior, relationships, information improves things. Better information leads to better experience, right? It leads to a more efficient working market. It leads to, um, you know, better communication between peers. Information is generally, the more information we have, the better things tend to work. And that's true, I think, in the music technology space. One way to help prepare for the future is to have, you know, better centralization of information and data and ownership. One of the big challenges we have in the industry is if somebody wants to use the, the art that creators create, right? If somebody wants to use a song or use a recording, it's, it's not always easy to figure out how to go get the rights to do that. So if we can start to centralize the information, make it accessible, centralize standards so that it's not ownership information, it's not lack of metadata that's holding people back, it's something else. And the other thing is the more centralized it is, the easier it is to adapt. Imagine if five years from now, there's just some radical new service offering that we can't even think of, and we have to either adjust how we deliver the information, adjust some standard. If you if there are several hubs or centralized places where you can go and, and adjust, that's a lot easier than doing it across a million nodes in a system. So um, if the data and the metadata and the information is more centralized, more coordinated, um, and and less less spread out, it allows for easier adjustment to future changes. I don't know if that I don't yeah. know if that answers your question or that, not. But. That yeah, totally answers it. Kind of on the high level, I guess. Take it down uh, five thousand feet, and let's talk about. So, what tools does Sound Exchange have that kind of leans into this direction? Because I know you guys have built some some APIs that are publicly accessible and so forth that kind of help start to, to to fill in these these holes in the picture. Is that right? That's great, and I'm I'm glad you asked that question. It's it's totally totally correct. You know, uh, one of the things that drives Sound Exchange is what can we do to just improve the industry and make it work better. Like you said earlier, what can we do to remove friction and make um, allow creators to focus on creating, allow service providers to focus on you know making new consumer offerings, allowing record companies and publishers to invest in new talent, and in that never-ending goal and that thing that drives us, we have done some things that we've put out there in many cases just for the benefit of the industry. We don't necessarily charge for any of these. One example, for instance, is uh, the ISRC. I don't know if you, your mm -hmm. listeners are familiar with what the ISRC is. It's basically uh, it's an international sound recording code. Think of it as a serial number for a recording. It was created by the industry a couple decades ago. Uh, as a as a number that you could attach to a recording and have all the information you need about uh, about that recording, whether it's who owns it, who played on it, you know, what album it was on, whatever it may be, it was a great idea in concept and is has been rolled out throughout the industry. But there wasn't a central place where someone could go and use that number in a commercial way or make use of it as a as a public tool to help remove friction. We saw that problem and you know we have created the best sound recording database in the world, uh, closing in on upwards of 40 million US sound recordings sourced from the rights owners. So it's not crowdsourced and it's not, uh, it comes directly from the owners. And we have made that information available on our website. You can go to uh, soundexchange.com and there's an ISRC lookup uh, where anybody in the public can, can if you know the number you wanna know the details, you can do that or vice versa. Uh, we often have uh, product codes in there and things of that nature. So you can search in a variety of different ways. And we've upgraded that to an API so that some of the service providers out there who operate on these millions and millions of recordings can just plug in through an API. It closes the data loop. Data loop. It makes, uh, you know, it has them reporting back to us the information that we know is authoritative sourced from the rights owners. And all of that helps make things move more efficiently. It helps us pay out more accurately and more quickly. So uh, it's it's an example of one of the tools we've provided to help um, to help cause a problem. I I can give you another example if you're interested. Yeah. Another oh, one. Oh yeah, I'd like to hear another one. Another one that we've done. So um, 
folks in the music industry know this, uh, folks outside the music industry may not, but uh, interestingly enough, for the past several decades, most new releases that are pushed out, most albums or, or singles that go out to the marketplace that are you know the, the hottest, uh, most popular tracks are actually operating without having all the clearances they need. Um, it's sort of been an accepted situation in the industry that recordings get pushed out before the publishing is cleared, before you know everyone has cleared the songwriter splits or the publishing ownership splits. Because you know songwriting, often when a song is written, there may be multiple songwriters, multiple publishers, and technically, all of that should be cleared and should be licensed before you put something to market. That hasn't happened for decades, and it's sort of been accepted that that these these albums can be pushed out or these singles can be pushed out and will set aside the publishing money uh, to be paid out once all that is sorted without getting into you know why that happens or whose fault it is. Um, we're less interested in, in that than how do we solve the problem. So another thing that SoundExchange has done is we, we saw um, a lot of effort after the fact to try to address this problem. We said, well, what if we tried to create a tool that allowed record labels and publishers or people that want to put out recordings to talk to, to folks that own the songs. And we had a centralized place where you could uh, request clearances on new releases at the time they're getting released. Uh, or you can confirm clearances and it can all be recorded and centralized with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, it's a DDEX enabled standard that can tie directly into copyright royalty systems. And again, it is a, a way to remove friction streamline these clearances, really get the industry to where it should be under the law. We, we should be getting this information as we're releasing this because that, that way songwriters and publishers uh, can, can get the royalties more, more quickly and more accurately. That's another example of a tool that we've provided and we have um, many, many publishers and recording artists, uh, recording labels that have signed up to this to try and streamline the clearance process. That was a long explanation, and I'm sorry if I got into too no. much detail, but you know, it's how, how this industry works and how you get what you need to launch a music service is very complex, and anything we can do to help make it simpler, uh, we are all in to do that. I, I don't think it was too long of an explanation. I think, I mean, this that's really, we're getting into kind of the nitty gritty of, of this concept of future proofing by having these tools available where um, new services can connect to what the both the copyrights are and the royalties could possibly be paid out to the right people um so i, I don't think it's too far in the weeds at all so um but let's switch gears a little bit um two years ago sound exchange uh, acquired Simra, the canadian musical Re reproduction rights agency i'm curious what was the reason behind that sure well um look the acquisition of cmra provided us with a really exciting new opportunity to enter the music, music publishing administration market. Uh, we have we have grown a lot since you know what we were ten or fifteen years ago. Um, in your uh, in your intro up front, you talked about a lot of the stuff that we we have cut our teeth on and how we we initially grew doing you know administration for for these non interactive streaming services on on the internet. Right, you know now it's the uh, now, well, now it's SiriusXM from the sky or Pandora or iHeart. Back then, it might have been Yahoo Music. Uh, and we have branched out and are doing a lot more things besides just that. We are applying our technology and our know-how to do things. Uh, we help do data integrity work for uh, DSPs and labels. We uh, administer some class action settlements. We're doing back office work for some not some specific direct licenses out there, providing back office administration for things happening out there in the commercial marketplace. So we're we're much more of a uh, I think of us more as a commercial entity than a nonprofit. I think about us as more of a technology services, a data services, a music company. We're all of those things, and part of that vision was. Uh, you know, how can we bring what we've done to try to, to improve the sound recording side of the business? How can we bring that to uh, to the music publishing business? As the world gets more complex, as, you know, boundaries break down, as uh, country borders are less important, at least, <laughs> at least when it comes to uh, consumer use, um, wouldn't it be good for the industry? Wouldn't it help remove friction if we could 
you know, start to have a more centralized place where you could have recording information and music publishing information, where if you are a consumer or a business operator or a digital service provider, wouldn't it be uh, helpful to the entire process if the information on ownership of this thing you want to use that has both a song and a recording in it, if it started to get centralized? So um, we thought for a long time, if we could marry up some of the music publishing information with some of the sound recording information, it would be a good thing for the industry. And by the way, we're not alone in thinking that. Uh, many people recognize that as the future. Many people recognize that as the way forward. It's sort of obvious that, uh, especially as we start to deal with the complexities that we're talking about, having fewer places that you have to go to get the information you need, that's a good thing, right? Um, consolidation is sometimes bad, sometimes good. In this case, consolidation of data in a centralized place is a good thing. So uh, so that was what drove, drove us to look into acquiring CMRA. In particular, CMRA uh, dealt with an area of the industry, the, the mechanicals, right, that I mentioned earlier, that, that was challenged, that wasn't working very well. So that was... Uh, that was an area we thought, hey, maybe we can go in and, and try to fix this or help fix or help bring some more order to this area that, uh, that, uh, that, that wasn't operating as ideally as possible. Now, by the way, the MMA changed all that because the MMA has now created this entity that we talked about up top. Um, so uh, that, that's, we're pivoting a bit. But that was, that was why we purchased Simray to try to start to unify the back office centralize the information that everybody needs to make the industry work a lot better. Why, why a Canadian entity um, in that world? Well, um, partly because it was the main game in town in Canada. In the U.S., you had, a, you had a lot, you had multiple players representing different parts of the market, whereas in Canada, they were 90 to 95% of the market up there. Uh, secondly, they were looking for a partner. So that, that obviously is how we first got interested in them. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of overlap between Canada and the U S uh, the repertoire between Canada and the U S has a lot of similarities. The pays and the people that administer it are very similar. You know, you can start to imagine a North American approach rather than just a, a U.S. approach where, um, where if you could, uh, if you were servicing or providing administration to someone and you could offer North American rights instead of just Canadian rights or just U.S. rights, that's that's an improvement. Gotcha. Yeah. So so flipping back over to the label side of the business, how did I'm, I'm curious, uh, I think a little over a year ago, Pandora started doing direct licenses with labels, probably I think it was in conjunction with their launch of a, an interactive service. They needed to talk to the labels anyway, but that impacted direct licenses on their whole business. And I'm curious how that impacted Sound Exchange's financial health. Sure. Um, so uh, without getting, without boring your listeners too much, uh, many of the folks who stream just linear, non-interactive radio on the internet use, use a, a license under U.S. law. It's a statutory license that allows them to get permission to the recording. They don't have to go to a thousand record labels. They can get it, um, you know, just from, from the U S uh, code. Even with that opportunity, labels do have the ability owners of sound recordings can go and do a direct deal with whomever Pandora, Sirius XM, anybody out there. It's, it's, they don't have to, uh, uh, simply go through this government license. And that's what's happened with Pandora a couple years ago for the very reason you mentioned. Um, the Pandora wanted to expand into more interactive services, you know, it's things that allow you to request specific recordings or build a playlist or, you know, have a playlist of just one artist. All of that takes you into the world, uh, what we call the interactive world. And in order to do that, Pandora had to go get a license from the labels. So that's what they did. They went to the, uh, uh, they did deals with uh, many of the, the big labels and the big, uh, both majors and indies. But, and so, so, and what that meant is some of the money then that used to flow through sound exchange would still go to, to the labels. So we did take a little bit of a dip. I, I, I want to note that, uh, the labels were very cooperative and in response to requests by the artist community, we at sound exchange still process the artist share of the of the non-interactive tier that free tier the biggest tier on the bottom that you know that was what launched pandora and how they got a lot of their momentum 
uh, the record labels, both indies and majors, still have agreed to pay the artist share through Sound Exchange uh, because the artist community really wanted that because of the efficiency and the transparency that we bring. Uh, so we still participate and help administer part of those deals. But there is part of it that no longer passes through us and does go straight to the record label. And, and as a result, in 2017, we did have a, a drop off a little bit in our collections uh, as as that sort of worked its way through the system. But in 2018, you know, we were back up above where we were previously. And in fact, in Q1 of this year, our payments are up uh, over 16% from even Q1 of last year. So I would, I would, I would answer your question by saying yes, uh, those Pandora Direct licenses did have an impact uh, and cause a, a, a brief downtick in our collections, but we've recovered and we're back on the upswing above where we were back in 2016. Okay, cool. Good, good to know. I, I, I realize I'm kind of firing all these questions from all directions. You're handling it great, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, thank you. I'm faking my way through it. So. Yeah, you're doing great. Uh, but no, I just <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm like going in a lot of different directions. But it's like all these questions came up for me as I was thinking about the conversation and kind of digging in of like all these different things you've had to kind of address along the way. And th- there's another one that I want to ask you about that's. Um, Bigger than bigger than sound exchange, but I think related. There's been a lot of talk about how PR payouts get distributed by market share, and at one music. P- business, I mean, PRO, PRO payouts, right? Yeah, yeah. What did I say? Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think you said PR payouts, but PRO yeah. payouts, right? <laughs> I do think about since I run a PR firm, I do think about PR payouts. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, PRO. PRO payouts um, and market share. At one music biz session, a panelist pointed out that there's no single way to determine that, which I didn't realize. I thought there was just like a, a formula that was used. We didn't know what it was, but it was a formula that somebody knew. But given that music consumption is becoming more and more trackable by data, what do you think will happen with the idea of market share payouts? Because I'm thinking about radio, for example. You don't really know. There's, there's not as, or at least traditionally, there wasn't a lot of tracking exactly about making sure that the exact tracks that got paid are the, the rights holders are getting paid on on those that that airplay at a community radio station, for example. Um, now, now that everything's moving more and more digital, where you clearly know exactly what tracks are getting paid out, what's going to happen with this concept of market share? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You've got a lot of good questions, Dimitri. I must say, you've thought about this. Um, first off, in terms of how you determine market share. I'm not an expert on that because we have been um, we have been census reporters. I'll explain what that means in a minute. You know, from the get go, um, it is true that mo- what market share means is definitely not uh, an absolute and universal truth. Uh, you know, if you've followed, there's some of the publications in the U.S., for instance, that report market share, Billboard in particular. There's always a debate about well, if I'm a a big label and I'm distributing uh, a smaller labels content, you know, do, do, do I get the credit for the market share when I'm just distributing at that? Or should we, should the market share go to the smaller label that actually owns the underlying recording? So there are, uh, there are disputes in sort of how you define market share. And like anything else, when you're taking a sample or when you're, um, you know, doing estimates, it is definitely subject to some, some variableness. So market share is almost by definition going to be less accurate than actual granular data. And a lot of the industry for a long time worked on market share. And and when it comes to terrestrial radio, you're exactly right. A lot of terrestrial radio or FM radio, um, when they pay out to the, to the songwriters and publishers, because again, they don't pay recording artists like they should. And we're trying to fix that, but for now they, they just pay songwriters and, and, and publishers. Yeah, in many cases, it's based on samples, right? So, you know, five, six, eight weeks, whatever it may be. And that's that's a tough thing. If you pick the wrong week or if you're a, if you're a songwriter who happened to have a, a hit, you know, right around the holidays and for whatever reason that week's not part of the sample, it can really disfavor the folks that are not uh, as hot during the sample period and conversely, unduly favor people that are hot during the sample period. At Sound Exchange, we have been pushing for census data uh, every chance we get. Almost everybody that reports to Sound Exchange does it uh, does what we call census reporting. When Pandora gives us a log, when SiriusXM sends us a log, when iHeartRadio reports 
uh, usage to us. We get every recording that is streamed and we get, you know, the million, how many millions of times it was streamed. So we have very specific, very granular data, which makes sense, right? Because by definition, all of these things are computer based. Uh, it's a, it's, it's only stands to reason that you should, you're enabled and you should demand more accurate and more granular data. And why is that important? Cause it ensures, you know, fair payments, more accurate uh, payouts. It ensures the money going to the right people more quickly. So we, you know, we think, yeah, if you can, if you can base distributions of royalties on actual usage of a hundred percent of what was listened to, and you can be very granular, it's obviously the better way to go over market share. You know, there may, there may still be little things here and there where you, you have to resort to market share for lack of anything else. Um, but if, if, if it were up to us and, and the capability was there, we would always say census reporting, usage reporting. We want to know exactly everything that's played and how much it was listened to. That's a much better system to base distributions on, and it's much fairer to everybody. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious if there'll be resistance as a result from traditional players because of this shift, but I, I kind of feel like it's a, it's a technological uh, inevitability. Yeah, and and I can't speak to the resistance. I actually think, um, uh, and you know, I'm not an expert on ASCAP or BMI. Um, they they do very complex work as well. It's a little different than what we do. I do think there's some things they are doing to move towards a census reporting system, at least in certain categories that they collect for. So, um, I I agree with you. Te- technology is, you know, is a hard thing to resist, right? It's the it's the the wave of technology and the the pressure of, of improving things uh, is kind of irresistible. So hopefully people will hop on board. So I'm going to ask you another question that may be kind of t- tough to answer, but given your vantage point, I'm, I'm really curious um, uh, if you have any, any insights. Um, I'm curious about the current anti-Spotify attitude of many songwriters and publishers. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it just I'm curious because from my standpoint, it seems like Spotify is largely responsible for reintroducing scalable monetization back into the music industry. And so I'm curious, given your vantage point on these vast industry payouts, what's your sense of why there's so much Spotify hate on the publishing side? Yeah, no, it's um, <laughs> the... The music industry has a an interesting and complex relationship with the uh, the DSP community. <laughs> um, you are, I think, it's a fair observation that you make that, um, you know, if we were having this discussion back in two thousand and five, we would be citing technology and some of these uh, some of the listening habits on the web. We would be citing it as one of the primary factors for the decline of the music industry. You know, uh, the music industry still has not gotten back to the levels that it was at in 1999, 2000. And a lot of that is undeniably due to file sharing. You know, back then it was Napster, but it, it, you know, it, it accelerated to a lot of other services, Grokster and BitTorrent, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of undeniable that, that music listening patterns enabled by the web and the internet and technology really caused a hit to the industry back then. But I think you're, it's a fair thing for you to point out that it is now these same services or the same technology, streaming technology, that is partly responsible or in a big way responsible for some of our recovery. So, so there is this complex relationship. I think the, the tension and, as you call it, the, the Spotify hatred, I think you called it out there, going on is, you know, Put aside the there's there's a there's an appeal that's going on right now. There was a recent uh, rate setting proceeding where the songwriters and publishers got a bump in the rates, and Spotify is appealing that proceeding. And you know I'm not the I'm not the most expert on all the ins and outs of that particular litigation, but forget that. Just take a step back. I think what you're seeing is this: music is more ubiquitous than it's ever been right? Um, These streaming services are allowing us to consume music and use music in a way that, that even 10 years ago probably was unthinkable. You know, like think about smart speakers and coming home and asking this, this 
cylinder on your counter to play music related to the mood that you're in. That's a really amazing concept that even 10, 15 years ago, people weren't thinking about. So, so, uh, you know, this streaming economy has brought great things for the consumer and, and ways for creators to get into people's lives. But I think what you're seeing a reaction to is some of these services are making hundreds of billions of dollars primarily in some cases off these this music off what all of these creators have poured their heart and 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 blood and sweat into and there's a feeling that you know yes obviously we live in a in a commercial society and there's sure that these services should they should make make you know be rewarded for uh the things they bring to the game but not enough of those hundreds of billions of dollars are making their way all the way down to the actual creators. It's the recording artists, the songwriters, the studio producers. They are, they are making the fuel that drives the entire engine, right? Spotify would be a bunch of static without hmm. songwriters, without recording artists, without producers. Well, apparently it'll be a bunch of podcasts <laughs> is what it'll be. <laughs> fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, we could talk about the lawsuit. We could talk about the issues that is, you know, that are serviced in the appeal. We could talk about the fact that, um, you know, the the complex history that we have with the digital service community. I think what you're seeing is huge, huge profit and wealth being created out there, and not enough of it making its way to the people that underlie the very primary input that makes these services successful. And that that's kind of how I look at it at a, at a 30,000 foot level. It's really just a matter of basic fairness. Yes, we want services to be successful. Of course, we want music platforms to grow and thrive. It's good for, it should be good for the industry. It should be good for consumers, but it's only good for the industry if if they share properly with the folks who create the very underlying material that drives their, their growth and makes them so successful, makes them such a great service. So I, that's, that's what I think this is really about. Uh, you know, I think that's probably the, the, that the answer with the most clarity that I've heard of the moment in this, in this period. So I, I really appreciate you digging into something that's not directly in, in your, uh, your area of work, but, um, but that's super helpful. Um, so we've got just a couple more questions. Uh, sorry, we're running so long, but it's just been really interesting and awesome to have this conversation, get, getting lots of new kind of little tidbits about the industry as a whole and where we're going. And speaking of which, what can people hope to see from sound exchange in the coming year or two? Well, we're going to focus on, um, you know, as, as I mentioned up top, we're, we're, we're expanding into the publishing space. We are working to hopefully be part of the solution that the MMA created. Um, there are multiple entities trying to help provide the back office for whatever the solution is. And, you know, we think we would, it would be good for us, good for the industry, good for consumers, good for everyone if we were at least a part of that solution. So we're going to continue to focus on what we can do to bring our services to um, to the publishing market and actually and beyond. We view ourselves as a solutions platform, right? We've I, there's many solutions that we bring to the industry, the music industry, and anything we can do to help make it work better, uh, we're going to continue to push for. We're going to continue to advocate for. Um, creators of all types being paid fairly you know like, like i like i said earlier the i think the the gripe that a lot of people have with spotify is they're just not treating the industry actors fairly we constantly push to try to fix that our, one of our biggest legislative issues is obviously getting terrestrial radio the 15 billion dollar terrestrial radio industry to pay for the music um you know it's one of the things i said at, at music biz a couple weeks ago was the FM radio industry makes more money off music than the music industry. They are a $15 billion industry that makes money by drawing a crowd with the music and they pay exactly zero for the recordings and a little bit for the, for the song as they should, they probably should pay more for that too. <laughs> but so we're going to constantly fight for uh, artists and creators to get paid fairly. Awesome. Awesome. You know, it's, uh, it's great to have this opportunity to talk to you, Mike. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it was great to get to meet you in Nashville at Music Biz. Uh, will we see you at Meetem this year? I will be at Meetem at the Streaming Sun Summit on June 4th. So uh, look forward to sitting with Paul Brindley and talking through some of these issues as well there. 
great. Awesome. These, these conferences are, are super important to my career um, and my business, Rock, Paper, Scissors. And uh, it's great to have these idea exchange, to have the chance to meet people face to face. And um, I'm hoping we might be able to woo Sound Exchange to come check out our conference, Music Tectonics, which I'm going to make a little pitch for here. Um, it's October 28th and 29th in Los Angeles. So it's lots of lead time still from when this podcast episode is airing. But uh, it's these types of conversations that we hope to have with a little bit of a focus on kind of the innovation technology side with the music industry. I, I expect maybe half of the folks who come will be startups and, and tech and innovators folks, and the other half will be industry um, as well as investors, both on the, the um, on the industry side, labels and publishers and so forth. So the, the conferences have been a huge part of my career and my business, and I feel like Sound Exchange has done a great job at being very present at these industry gatherings. It's, I mean, that's how I came across you guys first, was seeing you really being vocal, um, whether it's at South by Southwest or the DIY Musician conference, always talking to creators, making sure they sign up, but also this this kind of focused around innovation and, and how to help the music industry through technology. So good work, Mike. <laughs> well, thanks to me. Look, I really appreciated this. I've always enjoy, uh, I've enjoyed talking to you now. I'm happy to talk to you more. I've really enjoyed the conversation and you're really doing a great service to the entire community through podcasts like this. The music industry is structured in a very complex way. You know, it's, it's, it's designed around a business model that's 50 years old. And as a result, it, it just like our laws don't necessarily fit with the modern music industry, I would say the industry itself and how it's structured uh, is probably not how you would draw it up if you were going to start from scratch today. And I think you're doing a great service by helping bring clarity and helping spread information because, you know, by, by people better understanding these issues, you're empowering them to be better whatever better producers better uh, better participants better creators songwriters better better entities within the music industry so i really appreciate you you know helping to helping to bring all this to light awesome well thanks for taking the time because if it was just me it would probably just be static thanks so much mike i appreciate it all right thanks Demetri. you have a good day you too you're listening to music tectonics